So family, we are concluding our series that was entitled what? Wonder Bread, Wonder Bread. And as we've been traveling through here at True City, uh, God prophetically declared that this was the year of access uh, for our church. And God actually wanted to use the Old Testament tabernacle um, as a guide to show us the various ways uh, that he gives access and actually how to properly steward that access all at the same time. And so we've been in this Wonder Bread series that is connected to um, uh, the first element, if you will, that's in the inner court of the tabernacle, which is called the table of shoe bread. And that one of the elements located there um, was an important element because that table, it actually consisted of 12 loaves of bread placed on the table as an offering to God, reminding us of three things. We should know it by now. One, his presence with us, his presence with us. Number two, his presence provision for us, uh, which I'm going to do some digging around as we close out um, today, his provision for us, and that he is, Jesus is our true nourishment. He's our true nourishment. Now, in the first half of the year, family, remember that God started us on a course during Truth Talk Tuesday, uh, which is our interactive Bible study dealing with the word process. Remember, for those that have been here and so um, I want you to meet us here this Tuesday, if you can, at 7 p.m. because we will be back at it. Summertime is over. Amen. Vacation turning up. A uh, true city outside is over. Now true city is back inside. Hallelujah. And I want to see your face in the place on this Tuesday night. Uh, but the powerful thing about Jesus uh, being metaphored as our bread is because bread has to go through a process in order to level up. And so I think this is very exciting, hallelujah, that we're ending talking about the process that bread has to go through because your loaf didn't just start out as a loaf. Your biscuits didn't just start out as biscuits. Come on, somebody, hallelujah. Your garlic bread, uh-huh, that you eat with your lasagna, it didn't just start out as garlic bread, hallelujah. And so it went through a process in order to level up. And so the Lord instructed to me before I get into this text that he actually wants to revelate uh, bread making. And so I said, okay, God, if you have something to say to your people, um, not a problem, I'll obey. So the Lord told me to get the proper attire. Be because sometimes when you're in the process of leveling up, you're going to have to put some things on to, to, to cover you properly so that it can prevent you from getting impacted by what it is that you're going to be creating. God will tell you, I want you to put, put something over you uh, for a season. It'll let people know when they slide by your kitchen uh, that something is being developed. It's actually a visual to let you know, I'm working on something. This apron is a visual that says, don't walk in the kitchen too heavy or you gonna mess up my cake. This is a visual that I'm dressed for the party, but I want to make sure that I don't get dirty while I'm preparing to feed other people. And so I'll put something on to cover me up so that this can take the dirt. And once I'm done creating, I slip it off and we're ready to get down to the get down. Do you have an apron? Do you look like what you've created? You ready? Okay. Let's go through, before we hit a text, the five basic steps of bread making. It's the last, last Sunday of the series. The five basic steps of bread making. Catch the revelation. First step, somebody say kneading. Kneading, which we can look at it from the K-N-E-A-D-I-N-G. We can also look at it from the N-E-E-D-I-N-G, but we gonna leave the N-E-E-D-I-N-G alone and we just gonna say because we N-E-E-D-I-N-G, therefore we need to K-N-E-I. 
E-A-D-I-N-G. Needing, check this out, hear God, because then I'm going into my text. This can be done, needing, in a mixer, or it can be done by hand. Bakers prefer that it's done by hand. Quicker to do in the mixer tastes better if it was done by hand. Quicker, hallelujah, done, done, done in the mixer. It saves you time. It's what's best for you as the baker. But it's going to impact the people that are eating what you're serving up. So the first question becomes, are you willing to sacrifice your time to make sure that your bread tastes good? I'm just, okay. And so you can, you can knead by mixer or you can knead by hand. Uh, they prefer by hand, but essentially the dough is stretched. Let me, let me, ah, uh, the dough, it, it, it's stretched. It's, ah, uh, and it's put, look at, oh, that's a whole lot. It. Yeah, it, it's stretch, it, but then it's not just stretch, because some of you have been stretching, you're wondering what's going on, then it's folded back on itself. You just stretched me. I thought we were done. Hey, why are you folding me back on myself? After it is that you stretch me, but after the baker folds it back on itself, then it's flattened back out again. I, I thought I was going to rise immediately. No, you're stretched, uh, then you're folded back on yourself, uh, and then you're flattened. That series is repeated over and over again until the dough has changed from a soft... You. Everything offends you. Uh, to a sticky, whew, everything that happens to you gets stuck on you. Mess uh, to a smoother and more elastic lump. Uh, this typically takes five uh, to 10 minutes. For some of us, it's been five to 10 weeks. For some of us, it's been five to 10 months. For some of us, it's been five to 10. God, what are you up there doing? Years. Uh huh. Uh, uh, but the point, this is a point, the point of this step is to really get everything inside the dough up close and personal with the yeast. Uh, we want to get that yeast in contact with all the things it loves to eat inside the dough. The purpose of the kneading is to get a good rise, a good flavor and a good structure. Somebody say needing. needing. Let's see a one. That's you. That's your vision. That, that's your dream. Needing, right? Needing. That's number one. Number two, somebody say rising. rising. They say first rise. First rise. <laughs> rising. First rise. Uh -huh. uh, dough is placed in a lightly oiled bowl covered and left alone. Oh, this is for some of you. You feel isolated? You used to have a social circle before you told them yes. Now I give you a yes, and all of a sudden I can't find nobody. My friends, they don't even check on me. It's as if I was put in something and covered up to the point where people cannot see me. But check this out, family. The rising, the first rise is left alone and covered, guess why? To double in size in private. Uh, James. Uh, this is where the baker says the real beauty of bread happens uh, uh, because the flavors uh, and a large part of what the final structure will be like happens during this covered isolated, nobody is checking for me stage. And sometimes
times because no one is around you, uh, because God has covered you. Uh, there's no one to say, girl, you look like you doubling, girl, uh, you're looking good. And so because you don't hear any verbal affirmation, uh, you're not aware of the fact that you're getting stronger. You're not aware of the fact that you're getting taller. You're not aware of the fact that God is expanding you. And this process of family, it typically takes a very long time, family. And that's the reason uh, why a large part of the final structure will be what happens during this time. Let me show you uh, what it looks. Look at that. That ain't nothing. It's, it's, but really quickly, can you see it move? It's, it's not exaggerated growth. It, it's slow. Slow and steady. This step takes quite some time to complete, and many recipes and methods, watch this, have been developed to speed this process along. We want everything quick. However, if a rise is too fast, the baker says it will result in a less desirable flavor, and it will shift the texture of the intended bread. Leaving dough to rise at room temperature is a very common protocol, as it is a a good middle ground for a quicker rise without negative flavor effects. A quicker rise done slow. A quicker rise done slow. A number three, this is what I don't like. Mm. Punching, also known as knocking. Uh, this is what, this is what it, the, dang. Just let, listen, let me do it one more. Mm, that hurt. Listen, in the punching or knocking phase, dough is, it says gently, but it's not gentle, quickly press down in the center using a fist which is where the punching term comes from. After a single punch, the dough is folded again on itself several times just to remove all of the air from the dough. This step is not as vigorous as the kneading stage and it's not as long, but if the air stays, the dough can't rise. Okay. Uh, again, we're just getting the air out so the yeast can be close to the stuff that it loves to eat, right? It also, watch this, makes the dough a little easier to work with for the next step. Could it be that God is allowing you to be punched so that you're able to take the next level of punching? So that when they, when they punch down on you the second time, it won't affect you the same way it did the, the first time. And that's important because the fourth stage is shaping. Somebody say shaping. Uh, shaping. This is what it looks like. Uh, we finally uh, stretched and we finally folded and we, we left it alone and we closed you over and we isolated you and then we took you back out and then we punched you down and then folded you back in on yourself and finally uh, we're able to shape you. Finally we're able to shape you and there are hundreds of folding shapes and techniques. Uh, uh, the bakers say a simple round is likely the easiest to accomplish uh, but we are just laying the foundation for or a good structure, if you don't shape what it is that you're making, or if you don't allow God to shape you, that means that when you rise, you will rise to deformity. And what's the point in going up if you don't look like what God intended? And I think, uh, oh my gosh, Christy, a lot of what's going on uh, is that people roll so fast uh, and they skip some steps. Uh, you skip some needed things uh, because you had the wrong person over your baking process. Uh, and so you went up and you shot up and all of a sudden you were large and in charge, but 
you're deformed. It's not, it's large, but it's deformed. It, it's tall, but it's deformed. It's popular, but it is deformed. And it may look good and still be deformed uh, because the definition of deformed is anything that doesn't look like what God wanted formed. So what do you do when it looks good to you, but it don't look good to God? Woo! What do you do when it looks good to the world? And God says, that's not the type of bread that you were supposed to look like. And so somebody say, God, shape me, shape me, uh, shape me, shape me. And then the last step, somebody say the last step. Here we go. Y'all ready? Proofing. Proofing. Proof, proof, a faith that hasn't been tested can't be trusted. Who has proved you? Okay, proofing, also known as second rise or final rise. Uh, family, this is when the dough enters its final rise. Uh, uh, the shaped dough, the shaped dough, uh huh, is placed in the baking dish of choice uh, and covered with plastic wrap uh, to avoid drying out and forming a skin on the surface. Uh, and the bakers say when it is done rising, uh, the dough should spring back uh, after being gently poked. Uh, if it doesn't spring back uh, after being gently poked, uh, I said if it doesn't spring back uh, after you didn't get the promotion, if it doesn't spring back uh, when you get a doctor's note that isn't favorable, if it doesn't spring back, uh, then it lets you know that it has overproofed uh, and you need to go back and repeat steps one, two, three, four, and five. Note that the dough likely will not get back to the same size as it was before you punched it down. This is okay and normal. Because bakers say, watch this, the final rise will develop better flavors and structure, but it won't be as high as the first rise. Mm. Some of you are already rising according to God's plan. But because it doesn't look like the way you were rising in the world, you're questioning the level of your promotion. But God came to let you know, don't put my godly stuff up against the world stuff and make it seem like I don't have the stuff. <laughs> when I bring you up, it's not about length and height, Dominique. It's about what the people are eating. And when the bread is good, it's not just you that will be nourished, but all the other people that will be able to rise as a result. And I would rather have a thousand of us on a level eight than me be on a level 10. The table of shoe bread. And so with that in mind, if bread has to go through a process to level up, and if Jesus had to go through a process to level up, then you are not exempt from having to go through a process to level up. And thus your money will also have to go through a process to level up. Uh, so I want to close out our series this morning highlighting a revelation in Jesus' method for being provision for us. Provision for us and how we play a role in experiencing it. And then so if you're ready for me to prove it in the Bible... Uh, I want you to join me in the gospel according to Matthew. I want you to join me in the gospel according to Matthew. Um, and you can stand. We stand for the reading of the word. Uh, how many people are ready for the word? 
This is our last word from the Lord. This has been a very important series for those that are called to birth things into the earth. Matthew, the 25th chapter, the 14th through the 29th verse. I'm going to read the Amplified Bible into your hearing, and I want you to hear the word of the Lord and hear it as a story. Uh, this is what the Bible says. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven uh, can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. Uh, the Bible says he called his servants together and entrusted them with his possessions, with his bread. To one, he gave five loaves of bread, talents. To another, he gave two loaves of bread, talents. And to another, he gave one loaf of bread, talent, each according to to his own ability. Uh, and then he went on his journey. The one who had received the five talents, loaves of bread, went at once and traded with them, and he made a profit and gained five more. And the Bible says, likewise, the one who had two uh, went right to work, made a profit, and gained two more. But the one who had received the one uh, went and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. And the story goes that one, uh, the one who had received the five talents came and brought him five more saying, master, you entrusted uh, to me five loaves of bread and see, I have made a profit and gained five more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful and trustworthy over a little. And so I will put you in charge of many things. Somebody say access. Uh, the Bible says share in the joy of your share in the joy of your master. Also, the one who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, uh, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have made a profit and gained two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful and trustworthy over a little. I will put you in charge of many things share in the joy of your master and then the one who had received one talent he also came forward I wouldn't have came forward but he also came forward saying master I knew you to be a harsh and demanding man interesting a reaping the harvest where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seeds so I was afraid to lose the bread and I went and and I hid the bread in the ground. See, you have what is your own. Uh, uh, but his master answered him, you wicked, lazy servant. You knew that I reaped the harvest where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter seed. Then you ought to have put my money with the bankers and at my return, I would have received my money back at least with interest. Uh, so take the bread away from him uh, and give it to the one who has 10 pieces of bread. Uh, the Bible says, uh, for to everyone who has and values his blessings and gifts from God, Jesus is our provision and has used them wisely, more will be given. And he will be richly supplied so that he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, because he has ignored or disregarded his blessings and gifts from God, even what he does have will be taken away. This morning as we close this series, Wonder Bread, I want to talk from this thought. Get your bread up. You can have your seat in the presence of the Lord. Get your, get your bread up. Get your bread up. A family, listen, kingdom access 
uh, at its essence can simply be described as God's lease agreement with man, right? That you can lease a home, we're circling back around to this, you can lease a car or you can lease an office space. Entering into a lease agreement is the same as entering into a management contract. Uh, this means that someone is retaining ownership or control of the home. Uh, someone is maintaining ownership or control of the car or the office or the property, uh, but they are trusting to turn the day-to-day -day management of it over to you, uh, entrusting you to do three things with it, uh, to use it, uh, to watch over it, but also to increase it. Uh, and at creation, God gave man dominion. Uh, we dealt with this during the kingdom series over the entire physical realm, making him the de facto king of the earth. Uh, uh, to dominate literally means to govern, uh, to rule, uh, to control, uh, to manage to lead or to have authority over someone or something. But there is a very important distinction here, family, that God gave us rulership of the earth, but he didn't give us ownership. That someone who gives up ownership to another person also surrenders responsibility for it. But with our divine lease agreement, God says, I'll let you rule over it. Uh, and I'll let you enjoy it uh, while I still carry the ultimate weight of responsibility for it. Uh, our lease agreement didn't begin in the book of Matthew. Uh, it began in the book of beginnings when God set up a specific qualifying understanding uh, with the first humans that were breaking bread. Uh, he told Adam, uh, listen, Genesis 2, 15 through 17, God took the man and set him down in the Garden of Eden to work the ground and keep it in order. The Bible says, as long as you obey me and do not eat the fruit of the tree at the center of the garden, you can manage this planet all you want for as long as you want, it's yours. There was no death at this point because the Bible says you can manage this entire planet all you want for as long as you want it's yours. Uh, the Bible is very clear that the earth belongs to the Lord, right? Because Psalm 24 and 1, it says the earth is the Lord's uh, and everything in it, uh, the world uh, and all who live in it. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, has God given you everything uh, but told you not to do one thing? Uh, and did you do the one thing that has now caused somebody to have to come in? And, and, and straighten everything out? Is it not enough for you to have everything if you can't have that thing? I want us to sit with that for a second because you can ruin your everything lusting after one thing. Let me go. Uh-uh. You can ruin your everything lusting after the one thing that God says, don't touch that. And the enemy will make you think that because you can't touch that, that you don't have everything. <laughs> but Calvin, he had everything. You just couldn't touch that thing. You still had dominion over that thing. Are y'all hearing? Just because you can't engage it. I just try to do simple like that. The way you want to. Does it mean, do you understand what I'm saying? That you don't have dominion over it. And the enemy is so tricky that you will be standing in the middle of everything. And all you can do is look at that tree. You think about it. You dream about it, you lust over it. And while it's enticing to you only because it has a boundary. Deandra Judge, if that tree was available, Adam wouldn't have been thinking about that tree. 
They're not that cute. It's just they're married. Some of us like married. Thank you. Dushana said, you're right. Thank you. Human beings are wired to want what we cannot have. And God comes to give you a revelation access. You already have everything. And you do not want to give up everything. Lusting after one thing. Just because God says, I'm trying to protect you. It is the owner of the house saying, you don't need to worry about this. This is above your pay grade. There are things that will come into the earth if you do this, that you won't be able to put this back to bed. The reason why you need to read the Song of uh, Solomon, the Songs of Song. It is like a pornographic something. You need to read that thing. The lusciousness, it is very graphic. And in the Song of Solomon, read the Bible, six, all 66 books. In the Song of Solomon, Tiana, it says this, don't you wake up a lion because you'll be hard pressed to get it back to sleep. That's what the Bible said. The Bible didn't say there was something wrong with lions. The Bible said, if you're not a lion tamer, that if you wake it up, you'll be hard pressed to get it to go back to bed. And so, uh, God, somebody's gonna get out of an adulterous relationship uh, tomorrow on Labor Day. Uh, God owns the earth. In an adulterous relationship, Kalana, believing for a husband. Lord, bring my man. You got to let go of that man first. God, that was for somebody. It's not anybody in here. It's somebody watching because we all saved in here. But if the Lord is talking to you across the internet, receive it. Let that thing go. God has something for you. And you can be with it at night. It doesn't have to go home to its family. You can walk around with it and hold hands in the daylight. That was for somebody. Send me an email. Because God has something for you. He is a forgiving God. As soon as you let that go and repent, it will be as far as the east is from the west. I don't know what God is doing right now, but I'm telling you what, listen to me. God has something for you. So God owns the earth, but we must give to God the owner and accord and counting of what we do with what he's entrusted to us. He will judge us according to how well we manage his bread. Uh, but the first question that we have to wrestle with this morning is whether we even view what we've been given as gods in the first place. Uh, could it be that the first reason why you can't get your bread up uh, is because you think it's your bread? That, that, that's the first reason why you're in lack. <laughs> because the little bit you have, you think it's yours. Oh my gosh, uh, how, how would you manage what you currently possess if I told you that it was God's possession? Uh, uh, because God says, uh, 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 this is what he, oh, am I on the right thing? This is what God says, take this down as a note. Has the lens of this is mine prevented me from getting mine? Has your lens of this is mine prevented me from getting mine. See, God is coming for the root of your thinking around money and possessions uh, uh, to show you, family, a revelation uh, that God wants to increase your harvest. Uh, uh, but, uh, oh gosh, in order for him to do that, you have to accept uh, that he uh, is the truth. Uh, you may run it, but you don't own it. And I think it's difficult for us when we realize that we run it, but we don't own it. And it's very difficult for us to figure out the two. And that's especially important for those that are tired of working for a company, which this entire generation is, uh, or tired of working for someone. Uh, you have entrepreneurial pursuits uh, that have gotten off the ground uh, because God uh, doesn't want uh, to increase you uh, unless you understand uh, that he's the one that is increasing and he's not increasing 
increasing you. He's actually increasing himself. And I've got Bible proof. Uh, I've got Bible proof. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4 and 7. But we have this precious treasure uh, in unworthy earthen vessels of human frailty uh, so that the grandeur and surpassing greatness of the power will be shown to be from God, his sufficiency, and not from ourselves. If your vision doesn't allow people to see God, it's not God. Now, if that premise is the case, then my second question to you this morning is this. How are you managing God's assets? Uh, not your assets, God's assets. How are you managing God's bread? Not your bread, but God's bread. What things, what abilities, what gifts, what relational real estate, or what resources has God entrusted into your care? And is he getting a return on the deal? And deeper than that is the question, would you manage your assets better if you knew that they were God's assets and not yours. Uh, because family, the truth is, uh, whatever you don't properly use, you will lose. And because everything pertaining to life can be found in the 66 books of the Bible, here it is right in the 25th chapter of the gospel according to Matthew uh, that we find a biblical lease agreement uh, that provides the cheat code uh, of how to get your bread up. Uh, when Jesus wanted to explain what the kingdom was like, uh, he chose to teach it by way of contract management uh, through his parable about a man who entrusted a sum of money, uh, which ironically the coin is exchange of that day was called talents uh, to each of his three servants and then he went on a long journey what if I told you family uh, that your money is locked up within your talent the talent that you think nothing of the talent that comes easy to you so you're deliberately trying to do the hard thing uh, Oh, that God's not going, that was good, to add anything else to you uh, because he's trying to maximize what he already placed within you. Uh, and I don't care how many times you go back to school, uh, if that's not the thing that God gave you the talent for, then you can have the degree, but you won't have the bread. Whew. What if I told you that instead of trying to grow your money, uh, you should be growing your talent? Your money is locked up in your gift. Uh, and what if I told you that you're more concerned with the package uh, than you are with the product? Uh, what if I told you that the money you want to spend, we've dealt with this on marketing. Uh, God says you need to spend on training your talent, uh, on perfecting your craft uh, so that it's profitable without debate, uh, so that it's so profitable that you don't need a negotiation. Uh, and the story goes, I feel like preaching now in our focal text uh, that while their master was gone, uh, that two of the servants decided to grow their talents. Uh, they decided to grow their talents instead of initially trying to sell their talents. Read the text. They didn't try to sell their talent. They tried to grow their talent. They decided to invest their talent. Uh, and the Bible says that because they invested wisely, uh, they received a double return. Somebody say, God, give me double. Uh, the text says, verse 16, the servant who received the five talents uh, began immediately to invest the money uh, and soon doubled it. Verse 17, the servant with two talents also went right to work uh, and doubled it. Uh, what if I told you that your money hasn't grown because it's still in your possession? It's not going to grow if you hold it. <laughs> Truth is, family, uh, no investment, uh, no return. Uh, uh, some of you are expecting to draw where you have not sown. Uh, but the first 
too understood that if they steward their talent wisely, uh, if they steward God's bread wisely, uh, uh, they didn't just think about today. Uh, they were considering tomorrow. Uh, and the truth is, family, one moment of sacrifice uh, can yield moments of reward. Uh, uh, but the key to the revelation about the first two servants' actions uh, wasn't about them getting more money uh, or gaining more talent uh, because it wasn't their money to begin with. Uh, it wasn't their talents to begin with. Uh, it was about the master seeing uh, that their wisdom made them eligible uh, to oversee. Uh, it made them eligible uh, to lead. Uh, it made them eligible uh, to have access. Uh, it made them eligible uh, to come behind the veil. Uh, you don't understand uh, that you can't lead it if you consume it. You can't lead what you eat. Oh, God. God isn't trying to take from you. He's trying to get more from you. And the more you will sow what he's given to you, uh, the more he'll give you uh, to charge over. Uh, and the Bible says that he rewarded them with increased privilege, not bread. Okay. All right, help me, Lord. Here we go. You have two talents. You work your talents. You sow your talents. You give back. You intern, Puff. And then all of a sudden, you stop moving your talent. And you start overseeing, Kalana, other people's same talent. And so you're no longer eating off of your talent. You're eating off of everybody else's talent. You're trying to hold on to what you got. And God is trying to give you what everybody else got. And you're not recognizing that God has a way to multiply you that is mighty sweet that if you just continue to sow back, that God says, I'm going to give you more bread and I'm going to give you more bread. And the more they see there's something different about this bread, then he's going to give you a warehouse that you can manufacture bread. Now, if you've ever been in the grocery store and gone down the bread aisle, there's a whole lot of bread. If you study grocery stores, the bread aisle, Tiana, is nothing but bread. If you go down every other aisle, there's ketchup, mustard, barbecue sauce, a bag of chip clips, random. You know, some of them aisles just as random. Goya seasoning. Now we in Hispanic. We went from American. Now we Hispanic at the end of the aisle. But when you get to the bread aisle, it's all bread. But there's certain things about certain of that bread that while the whole aisle is filled with the same thing you got, while there are other people in the industry that do exactly what you do, the grocery stores will tell you Wonder Bread that after all these years, after all the iterations, Kalana, one is something about that Wonder Bread. We have rye, we have pumpernickel, we have um, cinnamon raisin, we have wheat, we have honey wheat, we have, but still to this day, I did the research, there's something about this wonder bread. And God is trying to get you to the point where if you allow him to put wonder on your bread, you can stand in the middle of an industry where everybody does what you do, but they still can't do it like you can do it because there's a wonder on this bread. Somebody say, God, give me a wonder. Family, listen. The Bible says he rewarded them with increased privilege, but also increased responsibility. Now, I want to deal with those that sabotage their future. 
okay? This is the end of the series. You know what's coming on the other side. God's shown it to you. You can feel it. And you know you're ready to receive the harvest that comes from it, but the responsibility. You're afraid that you won't be able to manage. And so you sabotage. It's the same thing that high school seniors do when it gets closer to graduation. They've partied all year, excited, right, Calvin, about graduating. Then Dominique, in the fourth quarter of senior year, Calvin's like, they start failing their classes. They start acting out in the room and getting sent to detention because though they're ready to get out of their parents' house and though I can't wait to go to college. I mean, I took a tour there. I've already seen the campus. I know what my dorm room's gonna look like and I actually started decorating, but the thought that I'll have to take care of myself. I want my freedom, but my freedom comes with responsibility. And so you're not waiting on God to give you permission to go to the next level. What you're waiting on is getting your mind to accept the responsibility that's going to come with this level. Because remember, it's not more bread, it's more bread oversight. But family, the truth is, the height of your bread is directly connected to the height of your discipline. That's why you're in lack. You don't need more money. You need discipline for the money that you do have. And God is not going to give you more when you don't know how to manage what you have right now. The height of your bread is directly connected to the height of your discipline. Listen to this, a Luke 12 and 48, the B clause. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. God isn't just looking for profitability. He's looking for responsibility. And the message translation of Luke 12 and 48 says it this way. Uh, it says it this way, family. It says great gifts mean great responsibilities. This is the Bible message. Greater gifts greater responsibilities. People who are wealthy may not be smarter or even more gifted than you, but the Bible guarantees that they are more responsible than you. In the kingdom of God, why you want what you want matters. Uh, your motivation, motives matter. Uh, why? Because motive drives decision. Uh, and God says that if your motives are centered on you, uh, and not on me, then you will decide to do your thing with my stuff. So when we look at kingdom access, God asks, do you want to steward all of my stuff? Or do you want to make my stuff your stuff? Because watch this, if you humble yourself enough to remember that it's God's stuff, he says, I will retain the ultimate weight of it and the ultimate guard over it. Translation, you get to experience it while I pay for it. Translation, you get to have it while I cover the tab. Uh, uh, family, the text says, I'm almost done. Matthew 25, now after a long time, the master of those servants returned, right, to settle the accounts. You remember the story. Uh, and he dealt with all of them, the one with the five and the one uh, with the two. Uh, uh, and we go on to see that the story says to one he gave five and another he he gave two according uh, to his own ability uh, but I want to uh, fast forward um, a couple of places because I want to get to the one who spoke up so loudly um, let's see let me see if I can find it family um Gosh, it's the one Lord that says the one who had received one talent. Do you see that? Can you put that up for me? Okay. Okay, here we go. 
The one who had received one talent also came forward saying, here we go, Master, I knew you to be a harsh and demanding man, reaping the harvest where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid to lose the talent, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is your own. But family, the truth is, watch this, your perception impacts your ability. What's interesting about this text to me, Kalana, is that the one who hid the talent was very clear that it wasn't his. He wasn't in his pride. He didn't say anything about it being his talent. He said that it was God's talent. But sometimes, not only are you sabotaging because you're afraid of responsibility, you're sabotaging because you're afraid of going from working for man to working from God. Hold on. Now I'm coming to people that are called into ministry, and I'm not just talking about pulpit. It's hard enough to be elevated working for the man. What do I do when now I have a vision and God is my boss? I'm fully aware that this isn't mine. I'm clear that this is his, that these are his people. And I'm so clear that I don't want to mess this up. So because I don't want to mess up his stuff, I won't steward his stuff. I will hide it away. I will make it secure. I'll look over it, but I won't grow it. Family, listen to me. Perception is defined as a way of regarding or interpreting something or a mental impression. But watch this, family. You want to know what else the word perception means? Uh, it means to understand. Here we go. To understand. And God has two questions for you this morning. How do you see the one? That's the first question. Not just the one dollar, the one contract, the one customer, the one client, the one member, the one volunteer, the one staff. But God wants to ask you this. How do you see him? Do you see him as a taskmaster that if you mess up, that he'll take everything away from you? Do you see him as a God who will punish you if you mishandle something just because you made a mistake, right? Matthew 25, this is what it said. The servant given 1,000 said, Master, I know you have high standards. This is the same text, message translation. And you hate careless ways. I know that you demand the best and you make no allowances for error. I was afraid I might disappoint you. So I found a good hiding place and secured your money. Here it is, safe and sound, down to the last cent. And there's someone in here this morning or watching online, and God says to you today, how long are you going to live in fear? Not about your talents, but about the one that gave you the talent. He's coming for your embedded theology. The stuff that your grandmother said about God that's not in the Bible. The story that your auntie told you that was her experience, but it's not in the Bible. And you say, but pastor, it didn't turn out good for her. I know, but you don't know the sin that she was in as well. She left that out of the story. You didn't know that she wasn't a tither. She left that out of the story. And your insecurities are keeping your bread from rising. Your inadequacies are keeping your bread from rising. Your playing it safe is keeping your bread from rising. And your skewed view of the mercy of God is keeping your bread from rising. You're not trying because you may fail, but the reality is that God cannot fail. And if you would stop doing it, 
it and allow God to do it, then you're guaranteed victory. Uh, the message translation goes on to say this, the master was furious. That's a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. If you knew I was after the best, why did you do less than the least? The least you could have done would have been to invest the sum with the bankers, where at least I would have gotten a little bit of interest. And so as we close this series, this is what God is saying. Why are you doing the bare minimum? And excited when we say we're the house of greatness. Why are you just existing when the whole world is your oyster? Why are you just showing up when you can lead? Why are you scared of what I showed you as opposed to trusting that I'm able to perform it? God's first question was, how do you see the one? But his last question is this, how do you see the one who again gave you the one? If you can't see your one talent clearly, then you're not gonna be able to see God clearly. And Romans 5 and 19 says this, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, but so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. God comes to you today and says, I can do something with one. And you're waiting to multiply. And God says, if you would just give me your one gift, your one talent, your one ability. I know you have friends that are multi-gifted. But God says, I can do more with your one gift than they can do with the ten gifts that they have that they're doing on their own. And so I want to prophesy vision multiplication over you today. That you can believe that God doesn't need two to multiply. I prophesy that your eyes will become open at this very moment to see that God is able to breathe on your one attempt. That God is a multiplying God. Anything you sow to him or for him, it cannot remain in the condition that you sowed it. It must expand. It must stretch. It must double. And God said it must supply. God is a multiplying God. And he came to tell somebody, if you work it, I'll multiply it. The multiplier fed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread. The multiplier took one man and saved the entire world. The multiplier took the woman at the well and evangelized all of Samaria. The multiplier took a trembling Esther and saved all of her people. The multiplier took a Joshua who was young and missing the father of faith. And God says, no, everywhere your feet will tread, I will give it to you. God comes to you and says what he said to Joshua, start walking. And just as I was with Moses, I will also be with you. God, you're not waiting on him. You're not waiting on him. Don't ask him for another thing. Just start walking. If you move, he'll move just like that. If you give it to him, he'll put his wonder on it just like that. And before you can turn around to wonder where the next thing is coming from, the overflow will start to overtake you. 
And not only will you be looking for the second thing, you'll have the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth thing so that you can give a couple more to somebody else who's just getting started. I prophesy that you're going to be able to assist people and you haven't even gotten to the promised land yet. You don't have to stay in your current condition if you have a dream over your life. I want to get rid of frustration. God, when are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? This is the time you have every single thing that you need within you. And so God says, get walking, and I will make you a ruler over Israel the same way that I did it with Joshua. You don't have to wait to get to a certain age. You don't have to wait till you have a certain degree. And I'm a proponent of academic excellence, but I came to prophesy to you, start it now before you even register for the first class. God is calling you to step out into the deep so that you can get your bread up, not just to supply all of your needs, but so that you can be a supplier of needs. Everybody standing on your feet. And so we're done. What is the one thing that you're sitting on? As the Lord's been speaking today, what is that, that one thing? You might have put it out a little bit, but you didn't do it full throttle. What is that one thing that you may have buried out of a lack of trust? What have you buried trying to hold on to one when if you'd work the one, you could oversee many? So we're going to release the one today. We're going to sow the one today. We're going to work the one today. I want to give you these scriptures. You'll see them in your Bible app, um, but I want you to hold on to them. Second Thessalonians says, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Proverbs 13 and 4 says, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. And Proverbs 10 and 4 says, A slick hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. And then Proverbs 12 and 24 says, The hand of the diligent, I love this, this is your promise, will rule while the slothful will be put to forced labor. So work the one. One idea, one invention, one concept, one design, one song, one book. Somebody say work the one. And so let me pray over you because do you know that you can be walking in this before the calendar year is over? This is the year of access, and I ask God in the month of January that there not be one person that's sitting under the word this year that does not get to live out what we prophesied. And you still have time for God to do it. And so, Father, I'm asking that you would prompt your people to step out. I'm asking, Father, that as soon as they make that courageous one step, would you please show them what you're able to do? I'm asking that you would multiply that one act of faith in such a magnificent way that they will stand with tears in their eyes in wonder of the mighty God that they serve. And I'm asking you, God, that it be so supernatural that every step they take in the future, they will be able to track back to 2022. 
Let it be forever settled in their heart after this next step of faith that there is nothing impossible for you. And I pray, God, that the same multiplying that you do for them, that you will grant them the access and the trust to be able to be a steward of multipliers. I pray, Father, that there be communities, that there be lives, God, that are stored up underneath the wings of every single person underneath the sound of my voice. God, help them to believe that you can do it. And for some of you all in my spirit, help them to understand that they're worthy of it. And so I come against self-doubt. I come against every word curse. I come against every generational blockage. You might be the first, but you can do it. And God will send you company along the way. And so, Father, in this month of September, this month of birthing, God, I'm asking that they would just push. Because truly you are able to break through God on their behalf if they simply call on the name of Jesus. And so, Father, we want babies born. We want visions born. We want businesses born. We want new friendships born. We want relationships that give you glory born. We want ministries born. We want churches born. We want mission trips born. Father, we want businesses born. We want tech companies born. Father, we want schools born. There are principals in this room. Father, help us to just push once. And from that, God, allow us to experience a baby. Bless your people, God, as they do something radical in their faith this month. And we thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. If you believe that God will move on your one act of a push, just give him praise. Only if you believe that he can do it. Now, how many people are actually going to step out and do? How, how many people are actually going to take the one? And pastor, all I have is one. But how many people are going to work that, that, that one? Somebody God has been impressing on you even to leave your job. I don't know who I'm talking to. God says, just go ahead and try. And I had to leave mine. And I'm doing all right. Just try. step out. You have a parachute, the paraclete. You, pa Pastor, I got bills. Pastor, I got responsibilities. I want to be wise. I want to be a good steward. Obedience is stewardship. He can't do it because you won't let him. But testimonies are coming as a result of this sober word. Yes, God. In the name of Jesus, just give me a second. I wanted to get in down into your bones. It's getting ready to happen. You're closer than you realize. I see the baby crowning. It's on the way. Yes. And I know you've been carrying this a long time. And I know how long it took you even to be impregnated. Hallelujah. I know the contractions were painful. Mm -hmm. And you were uncomfortable in this last season. Uh, but God says that was all because you're about to give birth. Uh, hallelujah to God. And if you would just push.
push one time. Hallelujah. The first push is the hardest push. Uh, hallelujah. But delivery doctors will say sometimes if you just do the one push, uh, that all of a sudden the baby will start sliding out on its own. Uh, and then all of a sudden you're going to see a head, a full head. Uh, and then all of a sudden you're going to see a shoulder. And then all of a sudden you're going to see an arm. And then all of a sudden you're going to see a torso. And then all, off of one push. And all of a sudden you're going to see legs. And all of a sudden you're going to see feet. And then when it's all said and done, that vision is going to have a voice. And you're going to hear what you've been seeing. This is for anybody that can catch it in the spirit. God is about to do it for you. He's no respecter of persons. And so step out.